right, what's up guys? My name is Zach and today I am driving a 1990 Wartburg 1.3. Up front is a 1.3 liter inline four and down below is a four speed manual transmission. Now I am super excited to be driving this car for very obvious reasons. I don't know what it is. You probably don't know what it is. And I'm excited to share that with you today. I've done some pretty extensive research as well as talk to the owner. This is such a cool piece of just history. And those are my favorite kinds of vehicles to share with you. If you would like to share your own little piece of history with me, you can head on over to my website, zachpradle.com slash submit. It's a quick and easy submission form, takes under a minute to fill out, and I come out to you. But let's get back to the Wartburg 1.3. I don't normally talk about the history of a vehicle right off the bat. I normally leave that for the final thoughts segment, but I think this car deserves its own moment to explain what the heck it is. The Wartburg 1.3 was built in East Germany from the late 80s into the 90s, even after the Berlin Wall fell. For those of you unfamiliar with the Berlin Wall, after World War II, the Allied powers split up Germany into four quadrants. Britain, France, and the US ended up combining theirs pretty soon after, but Soviet Russia held on to theirs and made it communist rule. However, the people of East Germany didn't really like this, so they started fleeing in large numbers. This angered the Russians, and so they built a giant wall separating the country, forming West Germany and East Germany. West Germany remained a democracy, and we saw BMWs and Porsches and Volkswagens come out of that country during that time. But over on the east side, they were a communist country. And when they shut themselves off from the world, they didn't have access to cars anymore, so they started producing their own. Probably the most popular, most famous East German car is the Trabant, of which I have not driven yet. But another East German car was this, the Wartburg 1.3. This was for your doctors, lawyers, high up people, because <laughs> it was actually a four cylinder, four stroke engine as opposed to the two strokes that came before it. This was just below the Volgas, so not quite super luxury car, but this was certainly higher end than the Trabants that the average person would be able to get. Now, interestingly enough, this was actually built after the Berlin Wall fell. And even after Germany was reunited in late 1990, this has a December of 1990 build date because things hadn't fully transitioned back to Western culture. And they didn't want to unemploy everyone at the Wartburg factory. So they just kept making these until they ran out of parts. And that ran well into 1991, even when Germany was reunified. So this is a post Berlin wall Wartburg, which is a crazy thing to be driving. Let's get back to that drivetrain. The 1.3 liters actually sourced and built under license from Volkswagen. There is a little badge on the valve cover, basically the communist group that built the automobiles. However, normally there would be a Volkswagen logo there. It's a carbureted engine, it's very slow, but it is a four stroke, which is a lot more than a lot of other East German cars could say. Like I said, paired to it is a four speed manual. It's a rather vague shifter. First gear is in Washington, second gear is in Nevada, third gear is in Rhode Island, fourth gear, it might be in Puerto Rico at this point, I don't know. It's not very exact, but this car was built as an appliance. It didn't have to be exact. It didn't have to have good road feel. It just had to work, and the shifter most certainly does. Last but not least, of course, the Wartburg is front wheel drive because it does share those speckled little roots with the Volkswagen. So how does it feel to drive a Wartburg 1.3? I'm probably the only person on YouTube today that'll be describing a Wartburg to you. Well, it's very harsh. It's not cute and cuddly around the edges. The suspension utilizes your spine. The engine utilizes your sense of smell and overall it's rather a harsh automobile. I definitely wouldn't invite one of these to the neighborhood cookout, but again, that's not its purpose. Visibility is actually really good. Can't imagine it has any rollover protection and steering is actually decently light. So I guess I'm not complaining in all regards. With that stuff out of the way, let's talk about the interior because we have some even more quirks in here to talk about. Well, in front of me, I have two, if you can call it two gauges, 
Off to the left is my speedometer, and off to the right is my coolant temperature and fuel, which are actual LED lights. At the time, Eastern Germans were very, very proud that they had LED light gauges in their vehicle. So much so that these actually earned the nickname that roughly translate to Mickey Mouse movies because these lights would change and shift while you drive and to them it looked like a movie. To the left and right, I do have some buttons around the gauge cluster. So to the left, I have my headlights and my fog light switch. And off to the right, I have my hazards and rear defrost. On the steering wheel, I just have the Wartburg logo, which is a famous castle in Germany of which this car is named after. I do also have a horn on the end of my turn signal stalk, of which... <laughs> I love that. I love it, love it, love it. To the left of me, I have sort of a climate control vent thing. And then moving out of the door, this is your latch to get in and out. So you pull this knob out a little bit and then move it backwards to open the door. Very, very interesting. I also do have, of course, the crank for the window, but also I don't have any door locks. The only way to lock the front doors of the Wartburg are from the outside. Now, some people have speculated that this was to save money on interior locks. Some people have speculated that it makes it easier for the East German police to get into your vehicle if they need to. I'm not totally sure the reasoning, but there are no interior door locks for the front doors of the Wartburg 1.3. Moving into the center, I do have a non-factory radio. This radio was actually put in when this vehicle was sold in Hungary later on, although it is a Ferrari. So the first Ferrari here on the Shooting Cars channel is actually a Hungarian radio. Down below, of course, we do have the ashtray. Gotta have that. And our climate controls. There's no AC optioned here in the Wartburg 1.3. Not really sure what the arrows mean, but here they are. Then moving down the center console, I have a little cubby space and the shifter. The shifter looks straight out of like a Mack truck or a semi truck, which I think is a little interesting. I have the handbrake down below and I don't have any cup holders, meaning the Wartburg 1.3 fails the big freaking bottle test. I can't imagine that was very high on their priority list. <laughs> Then we gotta talk about the seats. The seats are very heavily sprung. They are very bouncy and not very comfortable when you first sit in them. But once you grow to be in here, they're fine. They really remind me of like my 1931 Ford Model A's seats. Very, very bouncy, kind of stiff, a little bit unforgiving, but they hold you inside the car and that was all Warburg was trying to do, so. I guess that's a win in that category. However, speaking of seats, we do have back seats, so let's go test out the back seats of a Wartburg. All right, so we're in the back of the Wartburg 1.3, and the same mechanism carries on back here for the doors, although I do have locks back here, which are counterintuitive to what we normally think of here in the US. You pull up to lock it, you push down to unlock it. I also do have ashtrays in the doors. I don't get many features, but, Europe loves their ashtrays. The seats are a similar bounciness of what you would find up here, but I don't know if you could tell, my voice is echoing. There is no sound deadening found at all within the Wartburg, which is kind of interesting. I do have a shelf behind me. I can't imagine how many East German babies were put back there to go to the market or whatever, um, but very, very cool to see and just be sitting in the back of a Wartburg. This was, you know, a doctor's kid would sit back here in East Germany in the late 80s, early 90s. Such a cool experience that, you know, probably hasn't been posted all that much about on YouTube. So I'm happy to bring it into the modern era. However, speaking of space and eras and things like that, let's go hop out. We'll take a quick look at the trunk and cargo space, and then we'll talk about the looks. All right, so we're on the back of the Wartburg 1.3. Push that in, and it does fly up on you. It's a trunk. Uh, the owner does take this to car shows and stuff. It's not that interesting, but it is massively large. This car had no crash protection. That was it, you know, your crumple zone was your trunk. I do get a spare tire, but that's pretty much it. So if you're wondering what the trunk and cargo space of a Wartburg 1.3 looked like, well, wonder no more. Now we gotta talk about the looks and you know, it is a car that is 100% for certain. Uh, it's rather unappealing. It, it's just functional. 
And that's kind of why I love communist cars so much. They play by a different set of rules. And so this car has headlights on it for the sole purpose of seeing in the dark. This car has tail lights for the sole purpose of warning others what you're gonna do and preventing crashes. They're not meant to look pretty. There's exposed screws and bolts everywhere. And so let's get on to my final thoughts. What do I think driving a Wartburg 1.3? Well, first of all, I mean, to me, this is the coolest car in the whole wide world. Driving an East German vehicle is so special, paired with the fact that I love history, I love learning about world events. And so to drive something from a world event is so cool. The other thing that I forgot to mention at the top of the video, this car, this exact car that I am driving right now is actually a little bit of a movie star. In the recent film, Black Adam, starring Dwayne The Rock Johnson, this was actually in the background of one of the scenes, this exact car before the owner purchased it. So this Wartburg 1.3 has actually smelled what The Rock was cooking. Pretty cool. Pretty neat. But to me, the coolest thing about this car is communist vehicles don't have to conform to what the people want. Whoever bought or owned this Wartburg didn't really have a say. And so because of that, they could make these cars as ugly as they wanted. They can make them as harsh and brash as they wanted because whoever owned this was just happy to have an automobile. And it's crazy to me if you really want to see the split between East and West Germany. This is a 1990 Wartburg 1.3. I've also reviewed a 1990 Volkswagen Corrado. These two cars were manufactured nearly back to back in the same region. One of them is praised for having a four stroke engine. The other one has a four cylinder supercharged engine. It's like comparing apples to supercharged modern oranges. But this is it. This is what people drove around if you were a little bit higher status over in East Germany. And that to me is so incredibly cool. Please, if you're unfamiliar, after you're done watching this video, liking the video, subscribing if you really like it, please go do some research about the Berlin Wall. What happened after World War II? It's such a fascinating time that really chopped up Europe. And those effects are sometimes still felt to this day. And so not only do you get to enjoy this little piece of automotive history, you get to enjoy this piece of world history. I'm so thankful I was able to share it with you today. That was all thank you to Chris for letting me take out his Wartburg 1.3. When he emailed me with this car, I had to Google it. I thought that he made a typo in his email, but he didn't. Chris has been absolutely phenomenal to work with. Such a cool and interesting guy. I'm filming a bunch of his cars that you're seeing here in this little demo reel of all the different interesting vehicles he owns that you'll see either on the channel soon or are already out on the channel. He's been awesome. Chris, I cannot thank you enough. This is a once in a lifetime experience and I am so thankful for it. But I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Don't forget to rate the video, comment on the video, and subscribe if you really liked it. Take care, guys.